Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, so today we're going to talk about measurement and of course as scientists how we get information about nature is through measurement. And so uh, a couple of things today that lay some of the groundwork for the different types of measurements and numbers we'll be using throughout the course. All right, so uh, the most common system of units uh, is the SI uh, or Systems International Units. And these <coughs> have uh, seven so-called base units. And then from these seven base units, one can derive other units. So those, those would be called derived units. So we have base units and derived units. The seven base units are for quantities of mass. This ba the SI base unit for that is the kilogram with the symbol kg. Length meters, time is seconds, temperature is Kelvin, amount is mole, current is ampere, and the luminous intensity, which we won't use too much in this course, uh, is the candela. All right, so these are the base units upon which uh, other units can be derived. And so just as a few examples, and there's more examples in the notes, uh, force, the SI unit of force is something called a Newton, the symbol N. And a Newton is made up of these base units. So meter, kilogram, divided by second squared, for example. Energy, joules, is the SI unit and again it's made up of these base units and so as we go through the course and introduce new ideas we haven't talked about force yet we haven't talked about energy but all of these quantities will carry units and we'll want to know uh, how to connect them back to the SI units. Now uh, the nice thing about the SI system is that there's a set of prefixes that scale by factors of 10 the values of the units. And if you go to either your, either your physics uh, book that you're using or your chemistry book that you're using, uh, you'll see these prefixes. So just a, a couple of examples here. Nano put in front of something. Uh, means multiply by 10, 10 to the minus 9. And then there's a whole bunch of other prefixes that are different powers of 10. So we might have something like 3.25 nanometers. So, uh, the symbol for nano is a small n. So nanometers. And so that would be 3.25 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. Now, of course, you can always look these up, but I would spend a little bit of time in the next few days looking over your the table in your book and trying to commit some of these to memory. A lot of them you'll already have kind of known from just hearing words used in everyday speak. Uh, and then the others that are maybe a little bit less, uh, you'll want to practice a bit more. Uh, just to point out one quick thing, uh, notice the kilo here. This is the strange one here because all of these, the base, say meter, so then a kilo meter or a kilometer would be a thousand meters, so a thousand times the base unit. But it turns out it's more convenient in this system not to work with the gram as the base unit and then a kilogram would be a thousand grams, which it is, uh, but the base unit is the kilogram. So uh, we use, this is the one case where we use the prefix in the actual base unit. All right, now the, the SI units are great, but they're often in, in certain pockets of the literature, they're, rare, they're sometimes rarely used. And that's because the numbers that the units that carry these units are ugly numbers. They're very, very large or very, very small. And so that area of science has developed its own units where the numbers are nicer. So things like five or 17 or something like that, rather than 3.2 times 10 to the minus 28 or something like that. So we'll see a couple of these as we go on. Uh, here's just a few examples. Uh, liter, that's something we're pretty familiar with because the SI unit for volume would be a cubic, cubic meter. So that's pretty big. And when we're talking about laboratory 
uh, experiments, a liter is a better size. So that'd be a large beaker, for example. Angstroms. Angstroms as chemists are very important, although they're, they're close to what a nanometer would be. So in many cases, angstroms are being replaced by nanometers. But in the, in the language of molecular uh, chemistry, a typical bond length is about a, a nanometer. So uh, nanometers are important on the molecular scale. Tor, uh, bar, and atmosphere are all very common uh, units of pressure. They're actually probably more common than the Pascal. And uh, the conversions here, uh, Tor is measured in millimeters of mercury. The reason this is so common is because barometers that were made uh, in the past had mercury and the pressure outside would push up the mercury up a tube and you would measure how many millimeters of mercury uh, are, uh, are displaced by the external pressure. So that's why that's a very common unit. The pressure on earth or in the laboratory Pascal's is a very small pressure. So in the laboratory, and just in the room here, we're experiencing about 100,000 Pascal's. So that's become a bar. Uh, and then older unit is the atmosphere, which is almost a bar. And that is, uh, so t typically the pressure at sea level, so uh, in laboratories that are in cities near sea, sea level, uh, Typically, the pressure is an atmosphere. Here in Minnesota, we're always a little bit less than an atmosphere because we're above sea level. And then we'll get into this more, but the atomic mass unit. So this is also when we're working on the molecular scale. Uh, kilogram certainly doesn't work very well for one atom of carbon, for example. All right, well, it's good to start, uh, and this is just something that will grow with you as you learn more and more about chemistry and physics, but it's good to start with some benchmarks and start thinking about things uh, so that in your head you can kind of picture the relative sizes of things. So I'm going to just point out a few length benchmarks here. So when you're talking about chemistry, you're usually talking about chemical bond. And as I mentioned earlier, that's on the order of an angstrom. So a typical single bond is uh, about an angstrom and a half. Double and triple bonds get shorter than that. So um, lengths of about an angstrom are a molecule. So if you have a, a long fatty acid, for example, that's 10 molecules or 10 bonds long, for example, that would be about uh, a little over 10 angstroms or about one nanometer. Light, in this, in, case, in this case, this is visible light, uh, has a range of lengths in, its, in terms of its wavelength, uh, but pretty much smack dab in the middle of our visible region is 500 nanometers. So it's kind of an easy number to remember. 500 nanometers then is uh, a good benchmark for the wavelength of light. So notice it's much longer than a typical molecule. So as light is passing, um, say through some water, a glass of water, uh, one wavelength of light encompasses, well, about three, 400 water molecules. Now, an atom itself is made up, and we'll get into this in the next lectures, what, what is the anatomy of an atom, but the anatomy of an atom, uh, I'm sure from high school and other places, you know, is a, there's some electrons, and then there's the nucleus. Much of the volume that that takes up is taken up by the electrons. So the nucleus itself is much smaller than uh, the atom. And so if you strip away the electrons and just have the nucleus, you go to a much smaller size. And for nuclear physics, uh, a very common unit of measure is the Fermi. And this is precisely one femtometer. So 10 to the minus 15 meters. So you can see that's about, um, well, about 10,000, 100,000 times smaller than, an, than the atom itself. All right, so when we make measurements, uh, we report numbers. And so there's some things we need to talk about in terms of reporting numbers. The first of which is significant fi figures, sometimes shortened to sig figs, or significant digits. 
So let's imagine here we are got <coughs> some sample and we're going to go to the balance in the lab and put it on the balance. The, sig the significant figures are the numbers that instrument gives you. So we have two different balances here in a typical chemistry laboratory. We have what's called an analytical balance and most of these read to four numbers past the decimal. And then we have a, what are, it's called the top loader balance, just reads to two past the decimal. And so as we compare each of these balances, if you need to make a very careful measurement that has a lot of significant figures, then we use the analytical balance. If we're less concerned about that, then we will use the top loader balance. So the number of significant figures, again, is what the instrument gives you. So here's one, two, three, four, five significant digits. These first four are considered exact. Now, it might not match what nature is saying, but this is exact in terms of the vernacular of significant figures. And then this is the rounded digit, right? So whatever would come next, this has been rounded to that. So this has five significant digits, four of which are exact, and the last one then is rounded. This has three significant digits, four of which, two of which are ex exact, and the last is rounded. Okay. All right, so that's significant digits. And I won't go in the, on lecture here, I won't go into uh, the rules of significant digits. That's going to be for sure in the, whatever chemistry book you decided to get or you were able to get your hands on and the physics book as well. So uh, again there, I would just go through the rules of significant digits when you add or multiply, take the log, take exponential. Uh, for adding and multiplying, that's what we're mostly going to be worried about. And um, we're not going to be too much of a stickler on significant digits, but you do know, you know when you have to give a report or actually report a real number, then you'll want to be very careful with the significant figures and you'll want to know where you can find the rules for more of the esoteric things, like if you have to take the sine of a number or cosine or log or something like that. So again, uh, consult your book for that. Also, uh, Wikipedia and other places have a good overview of the rules for significant digits. So again, we won't be talking about that here. Uh, when it comes to making measurements, we almost always make multiple measurements uh, so that we can get an average and the average is, uh, oops, got a little mistake here, or a little omission. The average is the sum, and this big Greek symbol here, sum of the measurements one through n. So n is the total number of measurements. And then each individual measurement we'll say is x sub i. So uh, the, uh, in this case, we will sum up x1, x2, x3, x4, up to xn, and then we divide by that total number, and that gives us an average. And I'm sure you've calculated averages uh, before, and your calculator may even have an average, help you do the average. Now, in addition to average, we want to talk about precision. So the average is a single number, but we want to convey to other scientists how confident we are in that number. And that's with the precision. And uh, the most used, there's various precisions, and your book will probably go through a couple of these. But the most used is uh, standard deviation. And so this is called standard deviation. Okay, and um, the formula looks a little intimidating here. It's a big square root. There's this summation sign again, uh, but let's just walk through it. So you'll, you will have calculated an average. We're gonna do a quick, simple example here at the end. We calculate an average, and that number then is used in this formula. So here's the average, and then here again, each of the individual measurements. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna subtract those two uh, but then square it. Now the reason we do that is you might measure short on one measurement compared to the average, long on the other. When you, if you were to just add those directly, those would cancel 
and you wouldn't be able to tell, did I just make two really good measurements, or two measurements that were really close to the average, not necessarily good, but close to the average, versus did I just have them cancel each other? So that's what the squaring is doing. This will always be a positive number, and so this will just keep accumulating uh, the difference here. Now that's going to be squared, so one, the units would be squared, so we'd have different units, and it's going <coughs> to not connect to the non-squared average here. And so that's the reason for the square root. Now what's going on down here, again it looks kind of like an average, where if this was just an n, this would just be the average, the average of the square differences. But there's this little n minus 1 here, and the intuition you want to have there is that a standard deviation is meaningless if you have one measurement. So you have to have at least two measurements to have a standard deviation. And so that's where that subtracting one comes in. So we can only even start to talk about a standard deviation. Uh, we'd have to have at least two measurements. And so uh, that's where the minus one comes in. Here. Now that's precision. Uh, the other thing we might be interested in if we can, and that is error. And sometimes we won't be able to do this. We'll only be able to do this if we know the answer, or what's more likely is there's a well-established answer. So let's say we develop a new experiment to measure the speed of light. Well, of course the speed of light, only Mother Nature knows the speed of light, but we have uh, over the years established the speed of light to many, many significant digits. And so we would take our new method, compare to the accepted value, the so-called accepted value, and that's this x accepted. We simply subtract our average from the accepted. And that's that's the what's called the absolute error. Now sometimes we want a more meaningful measurement is often the relative percent error. So if we're measuring, say, the length of a football field or a soccer field, and uh, we're plus or minus 10 centimeters, versus if we're measuring the length of this pen and we're plus or minus 10 centimeters, well, we'd have the same absolute error, but the error on this pen is much more significant. It's about 100% error, where the error of 10 centimeters on a football or soccer field is much, much, <coughs> uh, much, much smaller in, a, in, its, in, the, in its significance. And so we have something called the relative percent error, percent error. And that is the average so it's the error right here divided by the accepted times 100%. And that 100% is just to turn it into a percentage. All right, so these are the basic concepts. Uh, let's do, I'm going to just do a couple of things here. So first, let's get a, a picture of these. Uh, and then we'll just work through these formulas a little bit. And then finally, we'll come back to our units here and talk a little bit about how we would unit, use units in, an, in a formula. Uh, and we'll, we'll keep doing this through the semester, but just our first foray through it. So I'm going to just uh, open up a little spot here. So let's get a picture of accuracy versus precision. And so I'm going to draw four bullseyes, targets, and let's say we're shooting arrows at these. And in this case, let's say all our arrows land clustered together. There, there's very little spread on these. So we would say this is good precision. But we're quite a ways from the center, and if the center is the accepted value, or the, uh, so we'll let this be the, the analog of this center of the bullseye would be the accepted value. So all of our measurements are clustered, good precision, but we have poor accuracy. 
because we're off the, from the center. Now, let's say we shoot our arrows and we hit all over the target, but in all, all throughout the target. So on average, we are hitting towards the center. So we have good accuracy. But we cannot be very confident in any one given measurement. So if we knew this about our instrument, we would know we would need to take a lot of measurements uh, to, have, to be confident that we're getting an accurate answer. So we have poor uh, precision. All right, well, let's say we have a lot of scatter, and we don't average to the accepted value. Well, that's the worst case scenario. Then our instrument isn't very good. And we would say we have uh, poor accuracy and precision. Poor accuracy and precision. And this would be a device then that we wouldn't be too proud of. Right? And then finally, best case scenario, we hit almost always right away right in the bullseye. And in this case, we would have good accuracy and precision. And that's the ideal case. Now what's better, I mean, obviously this is good. Uh, if we have this situation, as I mentioned, then if we know that, uh, and we would know that by taking a number of measurements and seeing we get a large standard deviation, then we would know we would need, in order to use this device, to take a lot of measurements, as I said. If we know this, right, good precision, and then we have the ability to make an accurate measurement through some other case, or we know the accepted value, for example, if we know how we're off, then what we can do is make a, an adjustment, a calibration. So let's say we're always hitting a little bit high and to the left. Right? Then if we can characterize that, so if we can take a lot of known samples, determine that we're always this much off, then we can make a correction factor for that. And then our instrument is as good as this. Uh, here, then we should probably go back to the drawing board and uh, try to fix our instrument. All right, so this is a visual representation of the accuracy and precision. All right, let's, um, let's work with these formulas. We're going to use very simple numbers here so that uh, it, we won't get a, a good practice with the sig figs here, but we'll see how the average and the standard deviation go. So let's say we make these measurements, three, seven, uh, three, seven, six, and four. So this would be x1, x2, x3, x4. And so n equals four here. So how we would write the average, n is 4, so we'd go 1 to 4. That's going to be this, and then we're going to divide by n. Divide by n. So let's do this. 3 plus 7 plus 4 plus 6 plus 4 equals all over 4 equals 20 over 4 or equals 5. So there's our average 5. Okay, so let me write that up here. Actually, let me just go over here. So now let's do our standard deviation. 
So this is going to be sum i equals 1 to 5, or 1 to 4, sorry, 1 to 4. We have four measurements of xi minus 5 now squared all over 4 minus 1, or 3. And then we take the square root of that. So let's write this out. So we're going to go 3 minus 5. So that's going to be a minus 2 squared. So that's 3 minus 5 plus 7 minus 5. So that's a 2 squared plus 6 minus 5. That's a 1 squared plus a minus 1 squared for the 4 minus 5, all over 3. So this is going to be 4 plus 4 plus 1 plus 1, or 10 thirds. So we have the square root of 10 over 3, which is about 1.8. So how would we report our number? Well, <laughs> we would probably say uh, x, uh, our value, or let's see, we would report it as av average, so 5 plus or minus okay, our standard deviation. Now, we would probably do this, uh, although technically we should probably round this to 2. And so we would write something like that. So that would be our, our answer. Now let's just get error here quickly. So let's say for some reason we knew, we happened to know that the accepted value was 5.5, let's say. Okay. Now again, we're playing a little bit with the sig figs here, but just for the sake of going through the formula, the error then would be 5 minus 5.5 5 equals 0 0.5. And then the relative percent, uh, more, sorry, minus 0 0.5. That minus is important. Uh, so error, sometimes error's point is uh, just given as the absolute value of it. Uh, but we say minus 5. We also, we would call this the absolute error, even though this is a minus, so it doesn't mean absolute value. It just means not relative error. And the minus means that our measurement is shorter, or comes up short compared to the accepted value. Notice we put 5 minus 5.5 over 5.5, not over 5, uh, times 100%. Okay. And that would be our relative error. Okay, so that's how we use these formulas. And again, just practice with a few sets of numbers and you'll get good at this very quickly. If you are um, taking some measurements, then try to practice with this with some of your real measurements. All right, let's, uh, right before we finish here, let's imagine, um, so let's, let's take this here, force. We said that's a Newton, but we said that's a, comp that's a compound unit. And let's, um, Let's say we've taken, we've, we've taken some data and we're fitting this to a, a curve. So we're going to fit this to a curve where the force is some parameter time plus just, just uh, this is, could, is probably meaningless, but let's imagine we have, oh, oops, just C. Okay, we're, we've got some fit function here. And these are the fit parameters. 
Now we know force is newtons, right? Which is meters, kilograms over seconds squared. Now we know time is seconds. So here we've got seconds squared. Here we've got seconds and here we don't have anything. Now there's an equals here. And when we're equating two things, we have to equate apples with apples, not apples with oranges. So if it's a Newton here, if it's Newton on this side, this side has to be Newtons. Right? And that, that's a really important, uh, as one of the important aspects of unit analysis. If you look at an equation, the units on this side have to be this side. Furthermore, if we're adding things, we can only add apples to apples. We can't add apples to oranges. So this, this has to be Newtons, this has to be Newtons, this has to be Newtons. Okay? So we know right away that the units for C are Newtons, okay? or meters kilogram per second squared. Okay. Now, we know this has to be meters, kilograms per second squared all together, but there's a second squared up here. Right? So this is bringing in a second squared. So this, the A, right, is going to have to have an additional second squared here so we can cancel this. So A, so this whole thing, AT, is that, but here we are with seconds squared. So A's units are going to be meters, kilograms, times seconds to the fourth. So that AT, AT squared, is meters, kilograms, seconds to the fourth times seconds squared. We can cancel the second squared and get the right units. Okay. And likewise, B's units are going to be meters, kilograms, seconds cubed. Okay. So that's the way we can use units to get the right units in a product here. So when we're, again, to summarize, when we're adding or subtracting, we can only add and subtract things that have the same units. And this is also true even with the prefixes. So we can't subtract a kilometer from a meter. We want to put those into the same units before we subtract those. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, and so, uh, uh, again, look, read over your book. Uh, both the physics book that you have and the chemistry book that you have should work and work a few problems so that you feel good about this information.